Hello and welcome to BCM 215 Game Media Industries. In this lecture, we're going to begin to expand on ways of researching and analyzing game media texts, and I'll be introducing you to a methodology for exploring the historical context of games known as media archaeology. You will find an example of this approach in the reading for week two on the course Moodle page, and we're going to use that piece to take a look at the prehistory and early history of video games. As your pitch is due for your individual digital artifacts this week, I also want to spend some time planning your approach. One methodology for exploring the context of a text is known as media archaeology. Archaeology is the study of human activity through the recovery and analysis of material culture through artifacts, architecture and other material records. Media archaeology is an examination of the past that critically re-examines dominant narratives about older and obsolescent forms of commercial media like film and television, music and games. Archaeology is both a part of the social sciences and the humanities, which are the academic disciplines that study human society and culture. The social sciences include anthropology, economics, linguistics, political science and sociology, as well as others which overlaps with the disciplines that are considered to be humanist, such as languages, communication and media, law and politics, literature, philosophy, the performing, the visual and the creative arts, as well as others. Media archaeology operates in the overlap between these two disciplines, and it is conducted via close scrutiny of dominant narratives about media of the past, particularly the myths and legends that emerge from nostalgic memories of media technologies. Another feature of media archaeology is avoiding the trap of the inevitability of history, which is the idea that the reason for the games industry's current state is because of how it came to be, that the explanation for its current shape is a function of its purpose. Console Wars by Blake Harris collects personal accounts of the history of competition between Nintendo and Sega, both externally between the two companies and internally within each company, between their American and Japanese divisions. It's a good example for our purpose, not necessarily for its historical accuracy or claim to truth, but in the way that it reveals a history about these companies as being accidental, involving a series of risks and failures, but also successes that occur, yes, because they were planned, but some because they were lucky or dependent on unpredictable factors at the time. Another trap of history that media archaeology seeks to avoid is the focus on successes. When we talk about the history of video games or the histories of technologies, we tend to focus on only those that worked in terms of the games that sold the most, the designs that were replicated, or the aesthetics or functions that won out over their competition. Media archaeology is interested in the failures, the dead ends, the paths less taken as much as the most successful and popular ones. Another issue to consider is the way that video game critics and journalists typically talk about video game history in terms of timelines. This is natural, it's hard to avoid, we're going to do some of that in this subject, but it can lead to the trap of teleological assumptions about video games and the idea that the history that we have is the history that we were always going to have. Teleological accounts assume that history proceeds in a logical series of steps, that A plus B inevitably leads to C, which entirely overlooks the unseen and the unknown and the unpredictable connections and events that look like a series of natural progressions once we are viewing it through the rearview mirror. While it is very useful to consider the material history and the material reality of history and the design features of games and game technologies of the past, Media archaeology is also a post-structuralist approach that takes into consideration the broader cultural and social contexts involved in the ways that specific technologies, practices and texts are formed. The foundational work in the field of media archaeology comes from French philosopher Michel Foucault, whose 1969 book The Archaeology of Knowledge describes the process of archaeology as sifting through the background material that can help to figure out why an object, a way of thinking, or a media technology came to be the way that it is in any cultural situation. 
One of Foucault's central ideas is the idea that there are dominant systems of thought and ways of knowing and speaking which exist in what he calls epistemes. These are the discursive formations and the rules that operate beneath consciousness and yet come to define all the possibilities that determine the boundaries of thought and expression and language used in a given time and space. Take, for example, the notion of gender. In the past, the epistemological unconscious only had room for and allowed for thinking in terms of two genders, and indeed, frequently in terms of one gender being better than the other. Now, while contested, the episteme is no longer purely exclusionary and overly determined by a dominant discourse of binary categorizations in language. Science is another example of an epistemological regime with multiple epistemes each replacing the last as knowledge is expanded empirically through the scientific method. As new theories are established, the fundamental systems of rules are adjusted and expanded. Electricity, atomic structure, gravity, the speed of light, quantum mechanics, and so on. Science is an interesting example because it actually anticipates this kind of paradigm change. Finnish media theorist UC Parika expands on Foucault's approach in his 2012 book, what is media archaeology? In this, he explores the ways in which our conceptions of knowledge, time, communication, and subjectivity are conditioned by material technologies, especially the media. His approach is to argue that in many ways, the actual text is much less important to the meaning-making processes than the technological and sociological conditions under which things come into being and understood. This is very much in line with Marshall McLuhan's adage, the medium is the message. Parika draws on the work of Professor Erki Hutamo, whose book chapter, Slots of Fun, Slots of Trouble, An Archaeology of Arcade Gaming, is the recommended reading for this week. Hutamo argues that the electronic games of the 1960s and 1970s did not emerge out of nowhere, but had a core cultural background in material technologies that were both commercially successful and unsuccessful that can be excavated and examined by the media archaeologist. One of the main ideas from Hutamo's chapter is the understanding that modern video games have their roots in the pre-digital and pre-electronic past. Parlor games were the precursors to board games and is a term for a range of games and activities that are played indoors. Parlor games were very popular amongst the upper and middle classes of Great Britain and Europe during the Victorian era, but also well into the 20th century. The increased leisure time of the affluent classes and greater access to expansive property meant that purpose-built spaces for entertainment began to appear. These were called parlours, which became the location for many popular board games and party games, like charades, blind man's bluff, I spy, tiddlywinks, and of course, card games. The idea of a specialised space for games as a source of popular entertainment became increasingly common prior to World War I, when amusement arcades began to emerge. Known as penny arcades, these halls were filled with coin-operated devices that were very popular, including shooting galleries, love testers, mutoscopes. Mutoscopes are interesting. They were early moving picture machines that actually often featured lewd peep shows, as, and they were kind of slot machines. It's very similar to what we see now on Twitch. This is not a new phenomenon, but a common entertainment that is centuries old. The most notable antecedent to contemporary video games, however, is the pinball machine, a glass top cabinet that featured a spring-loaded firing mechanism for launching a metal ball to bounce between wooden pins set into the board. The earliest pinball games were created in southern Germany and were based on the French game Bagatelle, which is kind of like a, a tabletop snooker game. It's also important to note the simultaneous development of games like Pachinko in Japan. Pachinko machines, according to Fortune magazine, currently generate around 30 trillion yen each year. Modern pinball machines originated in the 1930s, with games like Baffle Ball in 1931, Ballyhoo in 1932, and World's Fair Jigsaw in 1933. But it was the 1932 Bally Bumper 
that introduced an electrified coil which created a scoring mechanism and an automatic ball removal mechanic, as well as a score tracker that changed the experience from a game of chance to a game of skill. Early pinball machines and early pachinko machines were essentially gambling machines. This really agitated government regulators, particularly during the Prohibition era in the United States, who were busy prosecuting gambling organizations. In the 1930s, the coin-operated industry shifted from slot machines, which were being outlawed, to other coin-based entertainments like jukeboxes and gumball dispensers. The mayor of New York City described pinball operators as slimy crews of tin horns, well-dressed and living in luxury on penny thievery. The same New York mayor famously outlawed pinball machines, conducted raids, and made newspaper headlines and front pages with images of him smashing pinball machines. Note here the very same concern over the connection between in-game gambling mechanisms such as loot box crates and the type of anxieties around pinball machines and gambling. Pinball machines changed in 1947 when D. Gottlieb and co. launched Humpty Dumpty. This was a new type of machine designed by Harry Mabs, which featured electromechanical flippers, bumpers that were player-controlled that could hit and bounce and launch the ball in different directions. This intervention transformed pinball from a casual gambling activity to a game of skill. And in 1948, the pinball manufacturers introduced the dual flipper setup that is common today, in which the flippers are independently controlled by the player, and a new genre of public gameplay was created. It's interesting to note that many bans on pinball existed in the United States and around the world well into the 1970s. I've mentioned the book A History of Video Games in 64 Objects by Dyson and Saucier in previous lectures. And it's a really great and interesting book that draws on the historical collection of games at the Strong Museum in Rochester, New York. Another good book to mention is Replay, The History of Video Games by Tristan Donovan. One example of media archaeology that we can take from both these sources is the electronic game Tennis for Two, which was assembled for Visitor's Day in 1958 at the Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York. Guests were able to interact with the small Dumont cathode ray oscilloscope connected to the Donna Scientific Company Model 30 vacuum tube analog computer using two controllers which simulated a game of tennis created by the nuclear physicist William Higginbottom who used newly available germanium transistors to build a fast switching circuit that translated the user input into on-screen movement. After the demonstration, the game was disassembled and almost lost to history. Just as we saw a connection between pinball machines and moral panics over games and gambling, we can draw a connection here between this proto-computer game and what's called the military-industrial complex. The Military Industrial Complex, or MIC, is the term for the informal alliance and structural relationships between a nation's military and the infrastructure that supplies it. In the case of video games, we are talking about the Military Entertainment Complex, or the MEC, which involves the connections and collaborations between the video games industry and the military whether it's the video game controllers that are used to pilot drones, for example, or how in the past first-person shooter games have been designed for recruitment into the military, or simply the glorification of military power through representation, and sometimes you even see access to military weapons in order to create authentic in-game sounds. The MEC is a large and very well-funded component of the video game industry. To go back to Tennis for Two, this proto-game was created using technical knowledge and innovation that assisted J. Robert Oppenheimer to construct the timing circuits for the atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, I'm not saying there's a direct connection, and I'm not saying that military first-person shooter games are going to go out and make um, young people want to join the armed forces, or even that they can contribute to gun culture or whatever. Rather, what I'm suggesting here is that there is often much larger interconnections between elements of video game history and the broader context of the time and spaces and systems and organizations in which they occur. And it's media archaeology, which is a really useful approach to bring these connections to light. One of the reasons I enjoy media archaeology is the shift in the focus of video game history away from what's popular, what was the biggest hit, 
what was the most sold units to consider what wasn't popular and what didn't work, as well as the unknown stories about the video game industry that we can bring to light. Sometimes there are really important innovations that don't quite work out. They're not commercially viable, but they still make an important contribution to the history of video games by paving the way forward, by making it easier for the success of others and different iterations. And Hutamo gives us a great example of this in the reading this week. The history of coin-operated arcade video games, argues Hutamo, is routinely said to begin with the appearance of of Nolan Bushnell's Pong in 1972. Pong was a massive success for Bushnell's company Atari, and it literally helped to establish the video game industry. But Pong was built on a series of lesser known innovations, including the creation of Space War by Steve Russell in the 1960s among the hacker culture at MIT, experimenting with computers available at the major American universities at the time. Pong was also a copy of the electronic ping-pong game on the first commercial home video console, the Magnavox Odyssey, which was created by Ralph Bayer in 1972, and Magnavox would later go on to sue Atari for copyright infringement. Pong is also the successor to the first video game arcade machine, which was a total commercial failure, Computer Space. Computer Space was a space combat arcade video game that was developed in 1971 by Bushnell and Ted Dabney, making it technically the first arcade video game. Computer Space and Pong couldn't be more different. Computer Space looks like it belongs in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, and it was actually featured in the science fiction dystopian classic Soylent Green in 1973. Pong looked much more like a device that the average person would find in their home. It had this uh, lovely retro laminated wood panelling set around a simple yellow frame, that lovely 70s font, and just a basic looking television set. Where Computer Space offered a complex simulation of space combat with a detailed set of instructions, Pong had one simple rule. Avoid missing ball for high score. Hutamo's chapter connects to the history of arcade games uh, between pinball and other mechanical and electronic entertainment devices like the Love Tester. But he goes even further to argue that the emergence of video games, specifically arcade games, was actually a manifestation of the changing relationship between humans and machines. He concentrates his approach on an archaeology of this relationship in terms of gaming in public spaces, specifically arcades. But Hutamo's argument actually goes back to the 18th century and the introduction of steam-powered machines and mechanical devices into the workshops and factories of Europe and America. These mechanical devices and steam-powered engines eventually became the Ford factory line in the 19th century, which we discussed in the previous lecture. Those machines fundamentally changed the nature of work and our understanding of productivity that had been the dominant episteme for centuries. The immediate effect was the loss of skilled labour and the dominance of the machine in the workplace, which made the human in the production line more machine-like. The implication is that the arcade cabinet has a similar effect, but instead of work, the focus is on play. And the end result is the making of human play more machine-like. Another point of Hitamo's essay is that innovations in video games don't just emerge out of the technical developments or game designs of the era, but they're part of a much broader set of cultural and social circumstances. Mobile games aren't just popular because they fit in your pocket and they're easy to download, but for a range of circumstances, including the way in which they have helped to contribute to our busy daily schedules that are filled in with small moments of in-betweenness that invites us to look at our screen. Mobile phone games are especially effective at filling in those moments. And the design of mobile games are the result of these types of social and cultural conditions, many of which are invisible to us until we go looking for them with the archaeologist's frame of mind. In this part of the lecture, I want to focus on the planning of your game analysis for the pitch videos that are due in week three. 
Here I'm going to adopt the approach from Fernandez Vara and spend some time unpacking the first steps that we need to consider in conducting a game media analysis, starting with the first three levels of analysis. These involve, one, developing an overview of the text, two, considering the formal elements of the text, and three, beginning to map the broader context that the text is situated in. Each of these three levels is, of course, interrelated. They totally overlap. They're not discrete categories or separate in any way. This is just simply a useful way of approaching the preparation of the analysis, right? This is a useful set of starting points. In the final analysis, you may draw on some of these. You may emphasize one over the other, but it's important in the starting phase of the analysis to consider each one of these elements and address them in your pitch. Game overview. To begin a media analysis of a game text or paratext, it is important to map the basic features of that text, particularly in terms of its distinguishing features and how it differs or is similar to others, including how it has been received by audiences. I don't just mean reviews, because reception can also mean adaptation, appropriation, and modification. In this way, paratexts like memes, mods, cheats, cosplay, wikis, YouTube videos, blog posts, social media feeds, all this background material can be useful in describing the game overview of your primary text. A game overview can include a summary of the technical design and aesthetic elements, but it's more about what the game is, who is the audience, how is it played generally. For example, what does the game mean to players? Is it used to relax and chill out with? Is it used to fill in time? Does it involve highly competitive play? Is it a game that takes a short duration or a long duration? Are there turns? Are there phases? Is it simultaneous play? Right, this is a kind of top level summary of the game and its role. The game overview should also take into account a game's constraints and affordances. A game affordance is what the game allows you to do, what it makes possible. But it's also important to think about what the game cannot do or might be able to do, but limits the player. For example, there might be temporal or spatial dimensions to this. How far can you move in one turn? What is the duration of a turn? What effect does this have on the game? Does the game allow you to cheat? Many games have embedded cheat codes like The Sims. Have players created hacks or mods that enhance or break the game in specific ways? The important point here is that the overview clearly outlines the game's domain of possibility. Let's demonstrate media archaeology with a quick example of a game overview. Maze War is the first person video game originally written by Steve Colley between 1972 and 1973 on the IMLAC PD-15S at the NASA Ames Research Center in California. Maze War allows a person to move around a simple three-dimensional maze using a tile system to move forward, backward, and turn left and right in 90-degree increments. The first-person view means that the player is looking at the world as if they were standing inside the game. The screen is effectively the view that their eyes would see. Maze War is a multiplayer game, and players can shoot at each other when they appear on the screen. Players were first represented to each other as giant eyeballs, and later versions as assemblies of dots and eventually human figures. Maze War was the first recorded game to have allowed two computers to connect to each other. And in 1977, a fully networked version was available for the early internet, known as the ARPANET. The player positions are depicted on a level map, and several versions featured cheats that could enable the host of the game on the network to track the movements of other players. Maze War wasn't particularly groundbreaking until Collie programmed the networking feature and players then became fascinated with seeing each other move around in the maze. When Collie added the ability for players to shoot at each other, an entirely new game genre was created, the first-person shooter. There were certainly things that Collie stopped the players from doing, 
for reasons of, of programming necessity. For example, players can't just run freely uh, or dodge because movement had to be tile-based. While the limitation to movement and shooting in a maze might seem simplistic given the interactive worlds that computer games can now provide, this limitation remains the focus of the first-person genre until recently. One of the reasons for Fortnite's global success has been the introduction of Minecraft-like building, which adds new player affordances to the FPS genre. Fortnite's Battle Royale mode of elimination, in which the playing area shrinks, is a new constraint. So while you have the Minecraft building affordance, you have the constraint of a gradually shrinking play space to produce an important change to the genre that change the landscape of popular game experiences. The next step in preparing for a video game analysis is to take account of its formal elements. This can be as simple as listing the basic rules of a game, describing its setting, documenting its theme and narrative, as well as its core genre features. A game's formal elements can also be included in terms of its representational qualities, the player controls and the software hardware requirements, as well as the game's difficulty settings, its goals, key challenges, and its sound design, visual design, and player cues. A game's paratextual elements can also be considered as part of its formal elements, especially materials like manuals, packaging, official website, and advertising. This might seem somewhat redundant, especially if you know the game particularly well, but it's very important to be able to communicate a game's formal elements to an audience that might not be familiar with them. It's also important to keep in mind genre hybridity, which is increasingly common. To go back to the Fortnite example for a minute, when you're talking about the game, which game mode are you talking about? Fortnite actually has two entirely different games that make up the primary text. There's the well-known Battle Royale version, which is actually free to play. Then there is the Save the World version, which is an entirely different game. It's a co-op survival game that you actually have to pay to access. When you double-click the Battle Royale icon, you're given the option of choosing these different modes. If you're actually talking about Battle Royale, which sub-mode are you referring to? Are you referring to competitive or creative? If it's competitive, are you talking about the single, duo, or squad modes? Ideally, as part of the game overview, you are taking into account the formal aspects because they reveal the way the text is constructed through the different elements that make it up. A stage performance is made up of a script, costumes, makeup, lighting, props, scenery, and of course, actors. It is the product of its direction and the performance of words and sentences. Songs are made up of arrangements of instruments being played that include notes and rhythms, different recording sessions, even gaps and silences. Similarly, games have very complex arrangements of software and hardware components, such as operating systems and platforms with special technical elements and graphics engines. Games have rules, mechanics, interfaces and control schemes, as well as formal structures for vision, sound, movement, navigation and interaction between players and between characters, and they often have dramatically different visual styles. As mentioned last week, this is very much in line with the structuralist framework of analysis, also called formalism. This approach to the study of texts emerged from literary criticism and focus attention to the analysis, interpretation, and evaluation of plot and narrative, as well as textual devices, such as grammar, syntax, and tropes. Formalism typically excludes the text's broader historical implications, and it ignores the idea of the author's intention or biographical circumstances, and it's not concerned with the larger cultural context that the text is situated within. Formalism is a type of structuralism that looks at the text as an instance in a larger, overarching system of structure that has a set of clearly distinguishable grammatical-like rules that assist the way the text can be understood and the way that meaning is made. 
The classic example of formalist structuralism is Vladimir Propp's system for analysing Russian fairy tales, in which characters fit into discrete categories, such as hero, villain, helper, princess, etc. And each character has a specific function in the text. Another famous example of structuralism is Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, in which he described the journey of the archetypal hero called the monomyth. George Lucas famously drew on this book to create Star Wars. The word archetypal is important because Campbell shares Carl Jung's ideas about the underlying structure of mythological themes and symbols, which are distributed in what's known as the collective unconscious. Context. In order to expand on the game overview and attention to its formal elements, the next step is to consider the context of the game. The context of a game media text involves the circumstances in which a game is produced and played, including other texts, practices, and processes that may relate to it. For an example of this, see Mia Consalvo's reading from week one. Texts are not isolated objects. They are the products of their time, place, and situation. If we ignore the larger context in which texts are created, distributed, received, and engaged with, we may miss elements that are essential to understanding it. Attention to context may include taking into account the social, political, and the techno-economic conditions and circumstances that helped produce the text. This is the core of the post-structuralist approach. As we discussed in the previous lecture, post-structuralism attempts to overcome the limitations of formalism and structuralism by looking at the wider cultural and social realities that impact on the formation and the reception of these texts. We can reveal important information about the text and expand on the interpretation of significant elements of the text by studying how the formal structures of the text connect to the broader social and cultural conditions under which they operate, and how they relate to other texts and paratexts. And that's why I wanted to start with media archaeology today. It's also important to note, and really emphasise here, it's best not to think about these two approaches, the formalist or the structuralist and then the post-structuralist, as being separate or isolated or even in opposition to each other. One of the things that you can think about in your pitch video is how they might work together in your analysis. I think a good example of this is Roger Calois' system for classifying games using the terms Aegon for competition, Aaliyah for chance, Mimicry for simulation, and Ilinx for chaos. These four categories are plotted on a spectrum between two poles, Padia or playfulness and Ludus, formality. This system is clearly formalist, but it has a post-structuralist dimension because Padia is a form of socially negotiated play and differs from culture to culture. It does not have formal rules and therefore is not limited to identifiable goals. In order to make sense of it, you have to look beyond its formal elements. Padia is associated with toys. It's associated with products like Lego. Padia is found in Minecraft in the creative mode and possibly also with The Sims once you enable the cheats and you can do anything you like. Cheating and modding is an extension of Padia and is an example of culturally informed and negotiated entertainment. Ludus, however, is entirely structural and it's play that is explicitly bound by rules such as chess or Candy Crush. It's characterized by regulation and strategy. But how different people of different cultures, different ages, and other backgrounds negotiate these rules would be of interest in a post-structuralist approach. I also want to point out that Padia and Ludus are not binary positions. They exist on a spectrum, and games, of course, can demonstrate elements of both, particularly because they're software and they can be modified or you can operate different elements at a time. The formalist analysis of text has a prominent history in literature and film studies, and it is very useful for standardizing approaches to describing and accounting for games and their elements. Formalist descriptions help us to identify noteworthy elements of games and compare them, 
although we often use market-driven terms or distinctive academic classifications. These can both distance the analysis from an audience and often it is more useful to use casual or non-generic language. Post-structuralist approaches help us to expand the analysis and bring greater degrees of intellectual sophistication and critical depth to the textual analysis, making it relevant to a broader audience. Remember that the goal of the digital artifact for this subject is not simply to review games, but to examine a game media text or paratext through a critical framework of at least three concepts in order to contribute new ideas and perspectives about those texts for a public audience. Thanks for playing, and I look forward to checking out the pitch for your digital artifacts later this week.